Greetings, church family. Today's daily Bible reading has us beginning the book of First Kings, really the book of Kings, because in the original Hebrew, First and Second Kings are one book, Kings. However, in the English, we do have uh, split books into two, just like Samuel, just like Chronicles. And, and in First Kings, the key word is really divided, and it can be divided into two major parts. Chapters 1 through 11 is the United Kingdom, uh, not to Great Britain, but under Solomon and the Divided Kingdom finishes out the rest of 1 Kings chapters 12 through 22, the Divided Kingdom under many kings. The purpose of 1 Kings is to detail the height of the unified kingdom of Israel under Solomon, as well as its downfall into the divided kingdoms of Israel, which would be the northern kingdom, the northern tribes, and Judah, the southern kingdom, made up of the southern tribes, and the downward spiral that those kingdoms take. And this uh, covers the years 970 to 850 BC, so really only 120 years worth here. It's pretty sad how quickly things go downhill. Uh, it reminds us of Joshua to Judges there. Uh, there is a special emphasis in First Kings on the ministry of several prophets, as well as the thorough rejection of the word of God by his people, Israel. Uh, again, for Second Kings, they were written as one book, the Book of Kings. The author is unknown to us, but whoever it was, they wrote during the exile, sometime between 561 and 538 BC, because of what material is covered and what material is not mentioned. Uh, there is a parallel here, just as we saw with Second Samuel, which was paralleled in or is paralleled in First Chronicles. Here we have a parallel with Second Chronicles, and so the main difference is perspective here. First and Second Kings gives us a prophetic perspective on Israel and Judah, while First and Second Chronicles gives us a priestly perspective, with the focus being on the southern kingdom of Judah alone. Well, let's dive into chapter 1, which was our reading for today. Verses 1 through 4, we see that David has now reached an older age. Second Samuel 5 verse 4 says that he's 70 when he dies, and that may not seem too old to us, but remember, this is after the flood, uh, but before modern medicine. And also, David lived a pretty rough life, a hard one. He was a shepherd boy after that. He was a celebrated commander uh, in Israel, and then he was a warrior king. So it makes sense that he would be so worn down by the age of 70. And it is encouraging to see that David, uh, not necessarily known for self-control when it came to women, uh, did not approach his new nurse in an immoral manner. Now, chapter 1, verses 5 through 10, we see that one of David's sons, Adonijah, which really means my master is Yahweh, Adonijah, or Adonijah, he uh, exalts himself to become king. Very interesting. My master is Yahweh is his name, but he uh, really lifts himself up. And David had never disciplined, we see from the text, Adonijah when he was young or rebuked him when he became a man. And so uh, the young man's pride ran rampant. David's commander, Joab, the priest Abiathar, they surprisingly follow after Adonijah's presumptive grasping of the throne. But David has quite the faithful contingent of men who are going to support the true next king, which is his son, Solomon. The high priest is Zadok, the prophet Nathan, David's bodyguard, Benaiah, and his mighty men will all support him in that. And there's a refusal here by Adonijah to invite Solomon. That seems to indicate that, uh, that Adonijah knows Solomon is the Lord's choice to replace David on the throne. Chapter 1, verses 11 through 37, you know, at first glance, it may seem as though Nathan and Bathsheba are being presumptuous themselves about Solomon taking the throne, going to David to perhaps manipulate him into doing this, because we don't actually see him declared as God's choice of the next king of Israel in 2 Samuel or so far in 1 Kings. But we need to remember 1 Chronicles is the parallel to 2 Samuel as well as the first couple of chapters of 1 Kings. And so there we see in 1 Chronicles that Solomon was indeed God's choice as king after David. 1 Chronicles 22, 6-10 shows this. So Nathan and Bathsheba, they're totally in the right in approaching David and informing him that Adonia was trying to make himself king before David passed the throne to Solomon upon his death. We see that 1 Kings 2, 1-4 through and 1 Chronicles 29-28. And David wisely puts together a kind of royal ordination posse to ensure that the people recognize Solomon and not Adonia as the rightly chosen third king of Israel. By putting him on his own mule, that really shows he's got David's support. 
in the rest of the chapter, verses 38 through 53, we see that Adonia and his enablers, which were every one of the king's sons, except for Solomon, along with every one of the king's servants, the men of Judah, except for uh, men like Nathan, and of course, Benaiah, and the mighty men, and Zadok, and all of them are with David. But they're feasting away, Adonia and his group, and they hear the uproar of the people celebrating the royal parade of Solomon. You know, if you've ever been to a major college or professional football or basketball game, you know thousands of people shouting together with loud music does indeed shake the ground. And Adonia and his guests are rightly terrified. Adonia actually goes to the courtyard of the tabernacle, clings to the altar to try and preserve his life from his half-brother, King Solomon. We'll find out what happens next time in chapter 2. Huge principle here, though, is to put off pride and to put on humility. Put off pride, self-exaltation, and self-ambition. What we saw in Adonia, putting on those is what he did. We need to put those off of us. Matthew 23, verse 12, we read, Whoever exalts himself shall be humbled, and whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. The words of Christ making it very clear. We are to humble ourselves, not exalt ourselves. James 3, 13 through 18, Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering without hypocrisy. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. You know, the greatest example of this is in Luke 18, 9 through 14. Jesus told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. He said, two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. And the Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes to of all that I get, clearly trusting in his own works. But the tax collector standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. Jesus said, I tell you, this man, the tax collector, went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. Have you repentantly turned to Jesus Christ in faith? being justified by the grace of God through your faith in Christ alone? Have you confessed that you are a sinner to the Lord and in need of that heart change? I pray that if not, that you would do so this very day. And then, uh, if you become a Christian this day, hallelujah, let us keep that humble character. So for all the Christians in our church body, we need to put on humility. You can't just put off pride and then just let whatever else. We have to put on Humility, 1 Peter 5, 5 through 7. You younger men, likewise, be subject to your elders. And all of you, clothe yourself with humility toward one another. For God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. That proper time is going to be when the Lord indeed brings those who have been saved by his grace through faith in Jesus Christ and literally lifts us up to him, exalts us by, by helping us to get to that position and making us into that position of reigning alongside Christ forever. And interestingly, it appears anxiety is closely related to pride, to self-exaltation. If you're struggling with that, if you notice that, uh, that you, you, you kind of cling towards pride, that you kind of exalt yourself, that you have this self-ambition of, of, of getting better in something for your own sake, it may be that there's a worry in you that stems from not being in control, from not ensuring things to go the way you want them to go. Maybe that's the sin that Adonia fell into as he considered his half-brother Solomon taking the throne instead of himself. Consider that anxiety might be very closely, is closely tied towards pride, towards not being humble. Well, these are a couple of principles that we've learned from First Kings as we've begun this book today. I hope you have a great day.